Hi everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Roxanne, and for this video, I want to talk about the idea of resilience. Uh, I am going to be talking relatively spontaneously, so I apologise in advance for uh, any inarticulacy or yeah, any uh, stumbling. I do have some notes because it's quite a complex topic, but I like to be relatively spontaneous when I make these videos and just talk to you, just, you know, telling you what's on my mind and things like that. So, where do I begin? I mean, right now as I'm filming this, um, well, I'm filming this in the middle of the pandemic of COVID-19, um, and for most of us, if not for all of us, it is a very, very hard time right now. Um, it's a time of great uncertainty and it's easy to feel anxious and um, fearful about the future and ambiguous about how things are going to progress. Um, I mean, people, there are so, like, all of us are affected by this to greater or lesser degree. And there are people now who are mainly self-isolating and in quarantine. There are people who are at the front line, key workers, you know, any people in the NHS, people who are helping others fight this virus and um, who are exposing themselves to danger every day. And there are also people who are supporting neighbours and vulnerable family members and helping each other out uh, by doing shopping and things, you know, um, that that some people might not be able to do because they are self-isolating. So all of us are facing this situation and all of us are facing it slightly differently. Um, and I was thinking about I was thinking about how to move through this in a positive and productive way. And I also was thinking about, you know, how there are some people who are really compassionate and empathetic and supportive of others and really help. Um, they're focused on helping each other. And then there are people who, who react in a way that is, you know, that is like demonstrating the concept of every man for himself. And there are people like that as well that aren't necessarily showcasing the best of humanity right now. Um, and I was thinking about them. And I was thinking how right now all of us are creating a legacy. We're creating a personal legacy about how we behave and how we experience this and what lessons we impart to the future and to the next generations and we're also creating a legacy as a as a mass you know as a civilization as a as a culture you know wherever we are we also represent our culture and our country so i was thinking about that and and also that in this situation i think resilience is a really important topic and idea to consider and talk about um and by resilience I guess I mean the strength to face one's circumstances with courage and dignity and hope. And that's how I understand resilience. I mean, everything that I'm going to say now is, you know, how I interpret um, the situation and these various ideas. These are all kind of my, my processing of these ideas. So I understand that, you know, people might have different interpretations and different opinions. But, um, but yeah, everything that I'm going to say now is authentically what I've read and what I've thought as a result of that. Mm. Excuse me while I drink some jasmine green tea. This is the early morning as I'm filming this and my voice is a bit sore. So, um, so I've made myself some tea to uh, help me out a little. Mm. But yeah, back to resilience. Um... I think it's, it's easy now to like feel overwhelmed. I mean, I'm talking about myself. Like sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the news and by the kind of prospects of, you know, after this situation. I mean, we, we are in a really, really tough, hard situation globally. 
Um, so I turned to books and films that have helped me in the past to focus on being resilient and to focus on being the best version of myself during times of difficulty. And I think it is Viktor Frankl who said that when, um, when a situation changes beyond our control, then we have an opportunity to think of how we can change to adapt to those circumstances or how we can challenge ourselves. Now, I am paraphrasing, but I seem to remember he said something like this. And actually, I want to start with Viktor Frankl. So I've got some books with me, the books that I'm going to be talking about now. And I've chosen Viktor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning for the first book that I'm going to talk about. But I've also got here Jesus Before Christianity by Albert Nolan, uh, which is very, very interesting. And also Tuesdays with Mori by Nick Alden. Um, now, I want to open this video um, with a quote by Viktor Frankl. Um, and I'm just going to find it. Um, like, I do recommend reading this book, but I'm going to summarise some things for you, just in the meantime. Uh, so Viktor Frankl said, Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I wanted to start with that quote because I think it is a good introduction to the idea of resilience um, and to him as well, and to his ideas. And now in this situation, we can see that people make choices. You know, people make choices all the time, whether or not we are going to be good neighbours and helpful people and compassionate people and brave people, or whether we are going to, you know, hoard food and think of ourselves only and um, stockpile and things like this, you know, that there is there are two pathways that we can choose to stand in solidarity with each other or to embody the quote, every man for himself. And, you know, I do think maybe there are times where, you know, it's best to strike a balance in that, you know, you can't neglect yourself in order to help others because you need to look after your own strength to be able to provide strength to others. So I'm not talking about burning yourself out in order to help people. But I am talking about the importance of staying resilient and staying open to others and caring about others, even in situations of great stress. And I wanted to choose Viktor Frankl um, when I talk about this subject because he is a great, great inspiration to me when it comes to maintaining courage and dignity in the face of great hardship. So um, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist who survived the Holocaust and several concentration camps. So he saw the worst of humanity, but he used his experiences and observations to develop ideas and therapy around finding meaning in one's circumstances and using your purpose and your meaning as a form of resilience to help you endure challenges and crises. So Viktor Frankl developed a therapy called Logotherapy, and I really like that he's focused around every individual having a very specific purpose and, and that all life has meaning, even if it's not necessarily recognised by others or validated by others. Everything we do sends out ripples into the world and influences, you know, the circumstances of others and it has an influence upon the world as well. Um, and I think having a sense of control and agency is important in situations where we feel and where we are vulnerable. Um, so I wanted to read you some paragraphs that for me have really helped during difficult times uh, that you can find in Man's Search for Meaning. Ooh. I am going to write all of the books in the description box uh, that, that inspire me and that I've used today. Um, and what Viktor Frankl goes on to say, actually, from the quote that I've just read to you, is the following. So he writes, There are always choices to make, every day, every hour, 
offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become moulded into the form of the typical inmate. Dostoevsky said once, there is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. The last inner freedom cannot be lost. That is actually Frankl, not Dostoevsky, who said the last inner freedom cannot be lost. And then Viktor Frankl goes on to say, the way the prisoners bore their suffering in the camps was a genuine inner achievement. It is this spiritual freedom which cannot be taken away that makes life meaningful and purposeful. Now, I am paraphrasing when I'm reading this because I'm picking out specific uh, fragments and uh, paragraphs, but this is kind of what I was mentioning before, the importance of being aware of what we do and how we behave and that we are always free to choose how we present ourselves and how we are towards others and how we face our circumstances and that is a control that is ours you know that isn't for anyone else to decide for us um and he goes on to say and this is all stuff that he thought about during his times at the concentration camps and then wrote about when he survived and once the war was over Victor Frankl goes on to say, The way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which he takes up his cross, gives him ample opportunity, even under the most difficult circumstances, to add a deeper meaning to his life. It may remain brave, dignified and unselfish, or in the bitter fight for self-preservation, he may forget his human dignity and become no more than an animal. Everywhere, man is confronted with fate, with the chance of achieving something through his own suffering. We ourselves were confronted with a great destiny and faced with the decision of meeting it with equal spiritual greatness. So... I mean, reading that, it really makes me think that if they were able, and if Viktor Frankl was able to think in this way and to to really make it his mission to face life with heroism like that, then we can also strive to do that, you know, like, no matter what the situation is. And actually, it may help us to focus on that, to focus on how we can be the best version of ourselves, because so much is out of our control. So I wanted to talk about that as, you know, maybe something that can help in being resilient by looking at how other people behaved in situations which are also drastic and traumatic. And for me, certainly, it helps me when I look and take inspiration from other people to see, oh, you know, that person behaved in that way and it was so hard when they chose to behave that way. So I can do the same, you know, whatever my situation, I can try to be like them. And I think it is important for each one of us to think about who inspires us and how we want to be and and use these examples or, you know, whichever examples for you are inspiring as a, as a way of giving ourselves strength in in hard times and, you know, giving ourselves inspiration um, and yeah, I just want to finish with a speech that Frankel gave in the concentration camp because um, he was asked when he was in the concentration camp to give a speech to the other prisoners and to provide some moral support to them because uh, obviously it was such a tragic situation um, and um, I think they knew that he was, um, I think he was a psychiatrist or yeah, I think he was a psychiatrist, but don't quote me on that because it's been some time since um, I read about Frankel's uh, specific career. But um, yeah, so what Viktor Frankl told the prisoners at the camp was, 
I said that each of us had to ask himself what irreplaceable losses he had suffered until then. I speculated that for most of them, so for most of the prisoners, these losses had really been few. Whoever was still alive had reason for hope. Health, family, happiness, professional abilities, fortune, position in society, all these were things that could be achieved again or restored. After all, we still had all of our bones intact. Whatever we had gone through could still be an asset to us in the future. And I quoted from Nietzsche, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. I had no intention of losing hope and of giving up. For no man knew what the future would bring, much less the next hour. Even if we could not expect any sensational military events in the next few days, who knew better than we, with our experience of camps, how great chances sometimes opened up quite suddenly, at least for the individual. I also mentioned the past, all its joys, and how its light shone, even in the present darkness. I quoted a poet to avoid sounding like a preacher myself. What you have experienced, no power on earth can take from you. Not only our experiences, but all we have done, whatever great thoughts we may have had, and all we have suffered, all this is not lost, though it is past. We have brought it into being. Having been is also a kind of being, and perhaps the surest kind. Human life, under any circumstances, never ceases to have a meaning, and that this infinite meaning of life includes suffering and dying, privation and death. We must not lose hope, but should keep courage in the certainty that the hopelessness of our struggle did not detract from its dignity and its meaning. I said that someone looks down on each of us in difficult hours, a friend, a wife, somebody alive or dead, or a god, and he would not expect us to disappoint him. He would hope to find us suffering proudly, not miserably, knowing how to die. And finally, I spoke of our sacrifice, which had meaning in every case. It was in the nature of this sacrifice that it should appear to be pointless in the normal world, the world of material success. But in reality, our sacrifice did have a meaning. I told them of a comrade who on arrival in camp had tried to make a pact with heaven that his suffering and death should save the human being he loved from a painful end. For this man, suffering and death were meaningful. His was a sacrifice of the deepest significance. He did not want to die for nothing. None of us wanted that. Now, I apologise if that was a bit of a long fragment. <laughs> um, but I wanted to read that to you and I wanted to talk to you about Viktor Frankl because, um, because I think that we can find inspiration everywhere. And like I mentioned before, this is a man who really has seen the worst of humanity. And if he was able to, you know, think in that way and to speak in that way to prisoners in the concentration camp, and if they were able to keep faith and keep hope, even in those difficult circumstances, then maybe we can do the same, whatever our situation. And the next book that I want to talk about is Jesus Before Christianity by Albert Nolan. Um, so for me, personally, when I read this book, I felt that it was more philosophical than religious which appealed to me because I'm not actually religious. So I do call myself spiritual, I consider myself spiritual, and this appealed to me because Albert Nolan um, interpreted the teachings of Jesus in a more, yeah, more spiritual and philosophical manner than a religious manner. Um, and at least that's how I interpreted it. Um, and I think that the ideas that Albert Nolan suggests and al analyzes, and that the conclusions that he comes to are very wise, and very insightful. Um, and I wanted to talk about this book now because of the idea that Albert Nolan mentions in it. I mean, he talks about all sorts of ideas, but one of the ideas is that um, our actions and our behaviour determine the future, which, you know, links back to Viktor Frankl. But also he kind of talks about solidarity. He talks about solidarity with other people and how hope and faith is needed to bring about good and positive change. Um, and, I mean, I was thinking, 
about this situation and about this book and how um, there are situations which are objectively crises, that are objectively disasters, but also how all, almost all, if not all disasters, can also be an opportunity for creation and a positive progress. Often destruction is needed for construction or creation. Um, so like, you know, as they say, the phoenix rises from the ashes. And uh, and there is a quote in this book that says, and th- so so this is based on on what Jesus said apparently, and Albert Nolan wrote this quote, which is, "The kingdom can come all the catastrophe," and that's actually a quote that stuck with me um, for many years. The idea that you know the way that I interpreted that that the kingdom can come all the catastrophe is that. Something positive and something good can come. You know, you can have a good life. Um, We can be the best version of ourselves. We can bring about the best version of the world. Or, you know, we can sit back and let the catastrophe come, which is, you know, the worst possible version. So it's almost like, you know, there are two choices. Either something good will come or something bad will come. Often both. But I like the idea that at least some of that is in our control. Um... So I'm going to read to you a little bit about um, about what Albert Nolan says about this idea. And actually he mentions uh, the example of the Good Samaritan to illustrate the idea of the kingdom in that quote. So I think most of us know the story of the Good Samaritan. So someone who helped an injured person on the roadside when everyone else just passed by. Um, so the Good Samaritan stopped and helped this injured man. Everyone else just walked on by because they had better things to do than help someone. And Nolan speaks of solidarity with other human beings as illustrating the concept of the kingdom or the kingdom of God. So, you know, even in this situation now, we see examples of people helping each other through this crisis. And these examples of compassion, empathy, solidarity and kindness is what I understand to be the kingdom. And I think what Albert Nolan says is the kingdom as well. So what he says, if we allow the parable to release those deeper emotions which we have been taught to fear, we shall never again have to ask who our neighbour might be or what love might mean. We shall go and do likewise in the teeth of whatever barriers. Only compassion can teach a person what solidarity with other human beings means. Of such is the kingdom of God. And this struck me as a good thing to talk about now, because I feel like compassion is part of resilience and compassion is important in this situation, as I've already said. Um, Because we've got an opportunity, and in every crisis we have an opportunity, to demonstrate these traits and to bring about the kingdom or bring about the catastrophe. Um, But it will be easier for us to bring about some positive change and to focus on goodness if we have faith and believe that it is possible to create that good in the first place. So actually Nolan continues on to say this, that um, in the face of total destruction, Jesus saw his opportunity of appealing for an immediate and radical change. Unless you change, you will all be destroyed. This is what he says. Um, And he also says, if you do change, if you do come to believe, the kingdom will come instead of the catastrophe. So this is actually what Albert Nolan um, understands by what Jesus said when he said, unless you change, you'll all be destroyed. So Albert Nolan then emphasises that if you do come to believe, the kingdom will come. Um, And, you know, I don't want to keep repeating myself. um, So I feel like, you know, all of these books and all of these topics really, really illustrate the same ideas and really um, talk about the same themes. But, like, I guess the important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, bad things are happening. And there's no negating that. But the way that we can survive it is by thinking about the opportunities to progress in our sense of humanity. Um, And... I really want to kind of ask all of us the question now, you know, how do we want to behave? Do we want to behave with panic and with anxiety? 
Do we want to channel individualism over consideration for the community? How do we want to continue on with our lives? Because how we are now, it will determine how we are in the future and how we see ourselves. So it's in a way not only for the benefit of others, but also for our own benefit to really think about the situation and how we want to, um, how we want to face it. And either way, I'll end now with a quote that can give us hope even if things don't go well. And even if, you know, in some way we don't achieve what we set out to achieve. And if, if the so-called catastrophe comes instead of the kingdom, Nolan says in that sort of situation, a unique opportunity had been lost, but it was by no means the end. There would be another chance, and still another, because the kingdom of God will come in the end. God will have the last word. Now, I think whether or not we are religious, or spiritual, or atheist, um, or anything else like that, can resonate with us, because it gives a sense of hope even if things go badly, even if the worst possible scenario comes about, there is always a next time and there is always hope for the future because we have to have faith that in the end, good will result. And, you know, using the qu a quote again, and I don't actually know who said this, like, everything is okay in the end. If it's not okay, it isn't the end. So, uh, actually, this brings me on quite well to the next uh inspiration for me which is um the Shawshank Redemption by Frank Darabont and Stephen King so Frank Darabont directed this film and Stephen King wrote the novella on which it is based and I think both of them wrote the screenplay I wanted to talk about this film because it's absolutely amazing I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it but I absolutely recommend that you go watch it um and it is a lovely film because it's a film that um illustrates hope in times of despair and actually, it's a film that, you know, is a great metaphor, I think, for any situation where you feel trapped or hopeless. Um, and it talks about, so the actual film is about prisoners in a prison called Shawshank and how they deal with the everyday life in that prison. Um, so the entire film is based around hope, which is interlinked with faith. In prison, the people there have lost hope about their future and their lives until someone comes in from the outside. And that person is called Andy Dufresne, who's played by Tim Robbins. And he is a man who was unjustly accused of a crime he didn't commit. And the whole film illustrates how he maintains a sense of hope and a sense of purpose and ambition and how that helps him to survive, even though the situation looks hopeless. Um, and there is a scene now, again, I won't give too much away, but I don't think that this is a spoiler so much. So there is a scene where um, where Andy is sitting in the cafeteria with his friends um, and he's talking to Red, who's played by Morgan Freeman. And Red tells Andy that um, he used to play the harmonica when he was younger, but he stopped and he doesn't see much sense of playing that instrument in prison. And Andy tells him, Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. And Red was like, forget. And Andy responded, forget that there are places in this world that aren't made out of stone. That there's something inside that they can't get to, that they can't touch. It's yours. And Andy reveals that the thing that he is referring to is hope. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind now and to share with you, that you know, various things can give us hope, various things can give us strength. And what Andrew is trying to tell Red was that, you know, in situations of despair, it is the most important to maintain, you know, your hobbies and things that you like and things that remind you of your own humanity and that give you a sense of purpose. You know, whether that is music, so, you know, playing the harmonica in Red's case, or whether that is reading, or whether that is any other interest that you have, that activity can help you to detach from your environment and to tap into your inner resources and to tap into hope. And that ultimately will help you to survive. So I wanted to share that with you because that is a scene that really stuck in my mind. And uh, 
I'm just gonna finish because I know this is getting to be another really long video again. Um, I'm gonna finish by talking about Tuesdays with Maury, which is another lovely book. And uh, it's written by Mitch Albom and it's actually based on a true story. This book is very dear to my heart um, and I recommend it to pretty much everybody I know because it's been like my guide through life. And I wanna share it with you because of that reason, because it is really important to me and it, you know, it might help you as well. And this book is a true story about a dying professor called Maury Schultz. Um, and this professor, the entire book is about this professor meeting with his old student, who is the author, Mitch Album, and they meet every Tuesday to talk about Maury's lessons on life. Um, and Maury, during this period of time, Maury is dying from a terminal disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is otherwise known as ALS. And this is a terrible disease, and like I mentioned, it is terminal. Um, and a lot of what I was thinking about when it comes to this book revolved around death. Um, you know, we are faced either now with the risk to our own lives, if we are among, if we are among the vulnerable groups, um, even generally, um, and death is everywhere right now, you know, we are faced with the risk of losing people that we love, um, it, these are just dangerous times, um, and I feel like, you know, death is on my mind a lot, and I'm sure it's on the mind of a lot of people right now, but where there is death, there is also life, and life is also everywhere, and I wanted to read you a fragment um, of Maury explaining how he detaches from his own mortality and how he detaches from dwelling on his own situation. And page 56. So he says, sometimes in the mornings, that is when I mourn. I feel around my body. I move my fingers and my hands. Whatever I can still move, and I mourn what I have lost. I mourn the slow, insidious way in which I am dying. But then I stop mourning. I give myself a good cry if I need it. But then I concentrate on all the good things still in my life. On the people who are coming to see me. On the stories I'm going to hear. On you if it's Tuesday, because we're Tuesday people. I don't allow myself any more self-pity than that. A little each morning, a few tears, and that's all. And then Mitch Albin told him that, you know, his disease is horrible. And Maury responded, It's only horrible if you see it that way. It's horrible to watch my body slowly wilt away to nothing. But it's also wonderful, because of all the time I get to say goodbye, not everyone is so lucky. And... I realise that not everything that I talk about, and not all of these examples obviously will be exactly applicable to whatever we are going through, but taking inspiration is a case of picking out the things that help you and that you can adapt so that it serves you in a positive way. And I feel like that kind of ability to detach from what is traumatic and really painful can serve us, can serve all of us really well in terms of facing whatever challenges we've got in our own lives and um, I just want to read a few more fragments like Maury thinks and talks about the importance of being prepared to die at any time not because of you know the morbidity of it but more a case of you know if you are going to die and, to, and you're prepared for it, you can actually be more involved in your life while you're living. No, I'm, I'm being a bit inarticulate when I explain this and when I talk about this, but Gamori goes on to say, once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. And I think what he's referring to is, you know, once you understand and really, really, once it hits home how transient everything is, then you start to take on a new appreciation for life. I mean, I know in this situation, I've started to appreciate the ability that I had before, you know, to just go out whenever I wanted to, or to go to a coffee store, like sit in a cafe, 
to buy anything, you know, to, um, I'm talking specifically about my circumstances. I appreciate the life that I had before this crisis more now that things have changed. And like even stuff that I can still do, I feel like a renewed sense of appreciation for that, you know, to be able to eat food and to have a roof over my head. Like I'm starting to really appreciate what people call simple things. Um, and that's why I wanted to read that fragment to you, you know, um, because like Maury said, most of us all walk around as if we're sleepwalking. We really don't experience the world fully because we're half asleep doing things we automatically think we have to do. And Mitch Albom asked, facing death changes all that. And, and um, Maury said, oh, yes, you strip away all that stuff and you focus on the essentials. When you realise you are going to die, you see everything much differently. Now, I, I would extend that to saying, you know, not only if you realise you're going to die, you see everything differently, but just any time of crisis can help you to see things differently. Like, even now, like, it's an opportunity that we have to kind of recalibrate how we see the world and what we appreciate about it. And um, Maury, when he was talking to the author, he was actually... Um, wheelchair bound and he was stuck at home so he couldn't go outside and he talked to Mitch in in the fragment I'm going to read now that even though he couldn't go outside and even though he wasn't free to do various things due to his condition he still appreciated the world much more than the people who were able to do those things so he says we are too involved in materialistic things and they don't satisfy us the loving relationships we have, the universe around us, we take these things for granted. Mori nodded towards the window with the sunshine streaming in. You see that. You can go out there, outside, any time. You can run up and down the block and go crazy. I can't do that. I can't go out. I can't run. I can't be out there without fear of getting sick. But you know what? I appreciate that window more than you do. I look out that window every day. I notice the change in the trees, how strong the wind is blowing. It's as if I can see time actually passing through that window pane. Because I know my time is almost done. I'm drawn to nature like I'm seeing it for the first time. And actually I was thinking about that because those of us who are told to stay indoors, even when it's beautiful and sunny, we can regret not being able to go out and enjoy it. But at least we can look at it out the window, or a lot of us can look out and see it. In some way, we can still experience the world, and we can learn to appreciate it, you know, to, to still be free inside, despite the circumstances. So I hope that this video has given you some ideas about resilience and that can help you develop and form your own ideas about what resilience is. Now I could go on and on more than I already have, but this video is already very long. Um, so I'm sorry about the length. Um, I tend to kind of really, really expand on things as you can probably tell. And I'm just going to end with a quote by Maya Angelou, which I found, you know, I didn't know this quote, and I actually found it in Selena Gomez's rare, like, CD um, booklet, which just goes to show you can find inspiration everywhere. And Maya Angelou says, Stand up straight and realise who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. You are a child of God. Stand up straight. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening to this video. I want to thank you for your support. And I wish you as good a day and or evening or night as it's possible to have.